Anyone who promotes a return to cloth masking or masking for the sake of children would appear to be out of touch with our knowledge base and therefore definitionally not an expert. I'm Kenneth Malcolm, and this is The Kenneth Malcolm Show. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the program today. So that what I just read off the top was a quote from an excellent article in the National Post on the uh, earlier this week. Uh, as you know, the mask mandates are now gone in Ontario. We no longer have to wear a mask. And uh, my guest today, Dr. Matt Strauss, wrote an article in the National Post. It was a top uh, trending article on that page. So the, the headline said this, I'm a doctor. Here's why I'm done with masking. And I was uh, so interested in that piece. I feel so strongly about this issue that I wanted to invite the author on, Dr. Matt Strauss, who I'm very excited to have on the program. Dr. Matt Strauss is the Acting Medical Officer of Health for Haldeman Norfolk. He is an ICU doctor at the Guelph General Hospital. Dr. Strauss is a former professor of medicine at both Queen's University as well as McMaster and a former Global Journalism Fellow at the University of Toronto. Dr. Strauss has been a vocal critic of Canada's pandemic response. In fact, he was one of the first public health officials in Canada to call for an end to vaccine mandates. So we're really excited to have you on the program. Thank you so much, Dr. Strauss, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, let's talk first about this op-ed that you had published in the National Post explaining why you would not be wearing a mask. So first of all, why don't you tell us about the study and the latest uh, material that would lead you to that decision? Sure thing. So um, what I talk about in the piece is that there are observational trials and experimental trials. And in general, kind of first year of medical school training, uh, any um, and really philosophy of science training, experiments tend to be taken more seriously than observation or, or observational trials. Um, so there have been lots and lots of observational trials of masks, and many of them have suggested that masks are helpful at preventing transmission. There's been only one uh, randomized control trial, that is medical experiment, on the, on the question of whether masks prevent transmission uh, on a community level. And that was a paper done by Abeluk and colleagues. Um, Abeluk, I believe, is uh, based at Yale. Um, many of his colleagues who did the, did the study with him were at uh, Stanford. Uh, and it was done in Bangladesh. It was a monumental task to do something like this because th so there was an experiment of, does my mask protect me? Can I, can I wear a mask and does that prevent me from getting COVID? And the answer was, mm, doesn't seem so. They weren't able to show it. That was done in Denmark. That was called the Dan mask trial. And that they only um, uh, looked at about uh, 3,000, 4,000 people uh, on that order. Um, to answer the question of, does having the whole community mask uh, prevent people, prevent the whole community from having more uh, COVID, you had to enroll many, many more people. Um, so they had 350,000 people uh, in that trial and they randomized them village by village. Um, so half the, not quite, but about half of the villages um, got this intensive mask promotion and uh, the other half they left alone. And what they found uh, after studying these 350,000 people uh, was no effect whatsoever from cloth masks. <clears throat> There was a small effect from surgical masks, so the the, the blue ones that we that we've worn in hospital for years and years, um, about an eleven percent decrease in transmission. So what I when I say in the piece is, oh, and and I should say the eleven percent decrease in transmission was only seen in individuals over fifty, and they couldn't see an effect in individuals under fifty. Um, what I say in the piece is this shouldn't really come as a surprise to us because we've studied masking um, for other infections such as influenza. Um, there have been many, many experiments, and the the medical consensus prior to COVID nineteen was that it wasn't very helpful to do this. And and so we'll all remember Anthony Fauci telling us not to wear a mask um, uh, because of I think some amount of panic, some amount of herd uh, mentality. Um, the mask mandates came down. There was nothing else to do. We didn't have effective vaccines. We we're going to throw everything but the kitchen sink at the problem. Now we do have vaccines. Now we do have this better. Um, type of study, an experimental study that says that cloth masks didn't really do very much and, and no sorts of masks really do very much for people under 50. Um, so I think now the dust is settling and we have to respond to the best evidence that we have, which is that cloth masking uh, is basically a security blanket for your face and, uh, and no sort of masking is, is really protective for young people. So I, I, what inspired me to write the piece was I was seeing a lot of people saying, we know masks work and we have to protect children. And I, I was like, that's not, 
that's not what the best um, evidence shows. So that's uh, that's really the, the thesis of the piece. And how long have we known this? Because it, it seems like the, the end of masks uh, sort of happened in stages that for, for some places like, you know, in southern United States or red states, they, they got rid of them really soon. And then you kind of had people that were maybe more liberal or progressive holding on to it. Um, wh- like wh- wh- when was it known by the medical community, by professionals uh, that these masks just don't really do anything? Um, known is a funny word um, because I'll, I'll, I'll say that, frankly, many of my colleagues don't agree with me this point um, who are practicing in public health they want to maintain mask mandates um, because of all of the observational trials that exist and and partly my piece was saying yeah but that's not um, you know we we usually have a uh, a hierarchy of evidence and we usually put um, experimental data at the top of that i think that it's difficult and i've seen this throughout my career it's difficult for folks to climb down from a tree once they've climbed up um, once you've taken a position, it's hard to reverse it. Um, and so I'm not going to say that it's 100% known, everyone agrees. I'm going to say this is the best evidence we have. And we should follow the best evidence that we have. Um, but this trial that I'm talking about, the Abeluk paper that was performed in Bangladesh, um, the trial was performed over the winter of 2020. Uh, I believe the results were first released in the spring of 2020. I would have to fact check that part, but as a preprint, um, and they were only published, uh, uh, sorry, they, they were released in the spring of 2021 and only published uh, in the fall of 2021. So it's been about uh, almost six months that this has been public information, um, but it does take longer than that for um, knowledge to translate into action. Interesting. Well, you sort of alluded to to the reason, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Early on in the pandemic, you, you mentioned that uh, Fauci down in the States said that uh, not to wear a mask. But in, in Canada as well, uh, Chief Medical Officer, the, the federal one, uh, Dr. Teresa Tam, uh, she, she, she came out and said that she wasn't really sure about masks. Some of the recommendations, because if you recall, she had uh, was one of the lead investigators that looked at Canada's SARS uh, reaction from, from the SARS virus. And, and I remember reading some of the recommendations that she had put in place, including the fact that uh, taking people's temperatures didn't really help because a lot of times people were asymptomatic or they didn't have a temperature, but they did have the virus. Uh, why, why is it then um, that, that so many of these recommendations that didn't really seem to be backed up by science or even backed up by the people who were out there, uh, the ones we delegated these decisions to the chief medical officers, why, why did we put in place um, these measures if we knew that they weren't really doing what we needed to um, in order to protect us? So there's a, there's a few things. Um, and I look, I'm not a social scientist. And I think anyone who is a social scientist is not going to be able to tell for 10, 15 years, uh, they're going to go through everyone's old tweets and try to and try to figure out what, uh, what on earth was happening. Uh, and when they do that kind of archaeology of what happened, I think a really important tweet in Canada um, was in mid March 2020, Patty Haydu, the health minister posted this picture of herself at um, uh, uh, the, the, the major public health agency, National Public Health Agency in Ottawa. And it was like a group photo where they were all kind of doing a group hug, not wearing masks saying, don't worry guys, we're gonna, we're gonna protect us uh, from COVID. And the, and the Twitter comments were, were um, so critical of the public health experts at the national agency saying, why aren't you wearing masks? Why aren't you socially distanced? So it's, it is true that there was, a, there was a big gap between the public's expectation of someone doing something and established public health practice and what the experts were suggesting at that time. So I, I, it is my suspicion that panic, herd mentality, political pressure did have something to do with why a lot of things were brought into place um, without, I would say, a very strong evidence base. And I think that as the, you know, the fear of widespread death um, is receding as the pandemic recedes, um, and I, I think we're going to be able to have cooler, calmer conversations about what we did that actually made sense and what didn't make that much sense. Well, I hope so. And I hope we do a full postmortem and figure out where, where the mistakes were made. So hopefully we'll, we'll listen to our uh, our future selves will listen to the people now who, who are talking about it. But when you said it's sort of a security blanket for the face, I, I can relate. I remember the first time I went grocery shopping uh, during the pandemic 
you know, we'd done the two weeks to stay home and fortunately we had just stocked up so I didn't need to go out. But the first time I went out, you know, I was like wearing gloves and masks and I was keeping away because like you just, we had no idea what was going on and it made me feel like, okay, I can go out, but I'm going to come home and I'm going to wash all my clothes and I'm going to like spray disinfectant over all the grocery bags before I, um, you know, wash them and put them in the fridge to give to the family. But it, Dr. Strauss, it seems that over time, we became more knowledgeable about this virus. We be, became had better tools, including vaccination. So once we hit a point where most of the population did what they were told to do, which is go out and get vaccinated, wh why is it, do you think, that we held on to some of these rules uh, for so long? Why didn't we, I mean, if this study that you're referring to was was performed in 2020 and, and it was sort of published and, and broadly known, uh, you know, this is the sort of gold standard when it comes to uh, studies of randomized control trial. Uh, w w why is it that, that, that it wasn't listened to and that we continued to push things like masking? In, in some jurisdictions, we still have masking. In some places, like I know when you go to an airport, when you go to a hospital, you're still made to wear a mask, even if it's a, even if it's a cloth mask. So w w w why is it that, that, that we haven't evolved our thinking as we've learned more about this virus? Um, I think so it's a few things, um, and and one is to a, a bit more of an answer to the last question. The the impetus to put all these things in place were well, we don't know so much about this virus. And remember, at the beginning of the pandemic, people were talking about a three to five percent mortality rate, which it's probably something more like a tenth of that we now know. Um, so people were really scared. And even if you thought cloth masks probably don't work, if you're talking about one in twenty people dying who get this, could it hurt? Could it hurt to put on a cloth mask? Cloth mask. I think the short term, no, it, it doesn't really hurt that much until you know more. Um, I think, unfortunately, fear is a little bit self-propagating. Habit is a little bit self-propagating. Um, and now we, now we know that this, this disease, COVID, it, 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 kills, it, kill, it kills and it killed a lot of people. It's, it's a serious disease, but it, it is 10 times less dangerous uh, than what we were initially were told. Um, so I think that the, the fear and the panic and frankly, social isolation um, have, uh, have really done a number on people and, and it, it's going to be um, something like uh, detox or, or uh, de-traumatizing to, uh, to, to let these things go finally. Yeah, we're certainly seeing that even with the vaccine passports, you know, a lot of people really outraged when those went away. They're still in place in British Columbia for the most part, to, uh, to my knowledge. Uh, you were one of the first uh, health officers to say, we, we need to move on, we need to be done with this. So can we talk a little bit about uh, the vaccine mandates and what, what your position is on those? Sure thing. So at the when they initially came down, I was not supportive of them. Um when I was asked uh, by a journalist in Halton, Norfolk, what I thought about them, I said, I think the same thing the premier said, which is, I don't like them, um, but I do follow the law. Uh, my concerns about them were, um, so even at that time, it seemed like they weren't providing, the vaccines weren't providing sterilizing immunity. And it seemed much more the case that your vaccine protected you more than your vaccine protected other people. And for the most part, if you were, reasonably healthy, I'm not saying perfectly healthy, I'm saying reasonably healthy and double vaccinated, you probably aren't, weren't going to die of COVID-19. Um, so it, it seemed to me that the onus ought to have been on you to protect yourself um, and not to worry so much about what everyone else is doing. <clears throat> um, because at, at that time in September, when they came down in Ontario, we were talking about 50, 60% chance it, it prevents you from getting infected. It prevents you from being able to pass it on to someone else. This is in contradistinction to um, older vaccines like the MMR vaccine, which provides like 97 to 99% immunity to measles and mumps, rubella for life. Um, so I, I didn't think it was appropriate to bring them down in the first place. When the Omicron wave hit, um, it became clear very quickly by, uh, by December, January, that the two dose vaccine series was providing about 0% um, prevention from getting COVID. So many, many, many people probably in your life, probably many people listening to this who were double vaccinated, got Omicron um, and probably gave it on to someone else. So when you're talking about something being 0% effective, a two dose vaccine mandate, wh why would we have a policy that was seriously divisive, seriously hurt, a lot of people, 
And one of the things I wrote about was the folks who are unvaccinated, they're not, in my experience, and I've looked after some, unfortunately, who were dying in the hospital. Um, they weren't angry Trump voters that, they, that they've been characterized as. They were often folks with lower education. Um, some were highly educated. I'm not saying everyone who's unvaccinated is uneducated, um, but many of them had low health literacy. Many of them um, had reasons not to trust government or reasons not to trust doctors. Either they had been hurt uh, by doctors or government before, um, or they came from a group who had been hurt by go uh, government or doctors before, um, namely uh, minorities and indigenous folks. So um, I, I, I'm very... Um, uh, grateful for a philosophy professor of mine, Maya Goldenberg. She wrote a book on vaccine hesitancy um, and she's been you know, on, on the CBC explaining it. Um, vaccine hesitancy is a crisis of trust. And if you wanna build trust with folks, threatening to toss them out of their job and not letting them go to a swimming pool is not a way to build trust with them. Um, it's right, this is a really long answer, but so for all those reasons, and marginalized folks were already marginalized, it was 0% effective and it was, it was causing um, extreme social discord um, in the, the trucker convoy, that sort of thing. So it, it seemed to me like the, the easy solution here is to get rid of it. It's 0% effective. Um, and that's why I wrote that piece for the McDonald Laurier Institute. Well, uh, there's so much there uh, that, that we can unpack. So I just, just curious uh, then. So at, at this point in time, you know, uh, Omicron came, everybody got it. Everyone in my household got it, including, you know, people who are fully vaccinated, the adults. Um, and to, to your point, uh, zero percent effective. So at, at this point, uh, what do you say to someone who is not vaccinated, who made that choice, who said, I'm, I'm just going to wait and see what happens? Well, what, what has happened is that they've seen that people who are fully vaccinated uh, still got COVID. So so so, so what, what is the imperative or why why do people keep telling uh, the unvaccinated to go get vaccinated if they could see you know, from experience that that getting vaccinated wouldn't actually stop you from getting Omicron? Sure. So I was remiss in not mentioning this because I was being a bit long winded. But so it, it still is the case that two doses of vaccine are 95 percent effective at preventing you from being hospitalized or dying of COVID if and when you get it. So they don't prevent you from getting COVID, which is that's the public health interest. If I can stop you from getting COVID and passing it on to someone else on a population level, that's important. When that goes down to zero, it's not a public health issue. It's a personal health issue. Um, you cut down your chance of dying of COVID by 95% if you get the vaccine. So probably you should get the vaccine. Um, with, uh, with some, it, one of the things I did when I started my role at Holden Norfolk, I said, if you're vaccine hesitant, um, talk to your doctor. But if you can't talk to your doctor, talk to me, call my office. There's nothing I would rather do than talk to someone about the benefits of you know, the good news of vaccination. Um, it is by far and away the most um, life-saving thing modern medicine has done. I think in terms of humanity's work at, at stopping disease, sanitation is first and vaccination is second. <clears throat> so I I've had dozens and dozens of conversations with folks who were vaccine hesitant. Most of them felt that there was something particular about them. So many, many of them were not against vaccination entirely. Many of them were vaccinated, but they felt that they had some particular issue that made them different. Um, either they had heart disease in their family or they had a bad reaction to some other vaccine um, and they wanted some sort of personal counseling um, on that point. So nine times out of the 10, if I personally counseled somebody about it, I would say, so, you know, I do recommend that you get it. Um, and, there, and in very, very few situations, would I say you shouldn't get it. But I, I do think people deserve that sort of um, personal consideration when it comes to injecting something into their body. Okay, interesting. No, I appreciate that because so many, uh, so many people who talk about the uh, vaccine, it very much is sort of like everyone must get it. There's no discussion, and they don't take any account to so many of the things that you mentioned about uh, you know valid reasons that someone might be hesitant about getting a vaccine, and uh, you know talking to them in a in an open way as opposed to just scolding them and threatening them and and using uh, fear and coercion, which is unfortunately uh, what we've seen. I, I want to shift gears a little bit and ask you, Dr. Strauss, a little bit about the sort of mental health and and economic health uh, issues that we have seen as a result of, of public health. So, uh, you know, for, for yourself as a, as a public official in medicine, a, a medical um, officer of health, do, do you, do, I, I'm just curious because it seems like for the last two years, the entire focus has been on COVID and so many other areas of health have been um, neglected. Um, in, in, in your opinion, in your professional opinion, 
what, what was that a mistake? How can we avoid that from happening in the future? And how can we now uh, shift the focus to make sure that that people's well being, um, their their uh, mental health, and and in just their ability to to work, to go out, to communicate with people, to live our lives like Canadians, to, to go back to having our country, being Canadians, um, to make sure that that's a priority um, and not a, you know a mysterious next wave that could come up and, and shoot us all back um, into into the same scenario that we've seen for the last two years. Um, that's a terrific question. If I could just add one more thing to the discussion of vaccines, and it's not to toot my horn, but um, when I when I talk about taking a personalized approach to folks and accepting and acknowledging their concerns, um, I believe that not only is that sort of ethically correct, it's practically correct. I, I believe you get more folks vaccinated that way. And the, the proof is a little bit in the pudding. When I came to Haldeman Norfolk in September, uh, we were fifth from the bottom uh, in terms of public health unit vaccination rates. Uh, Three months later, we were 15th from the bottom, uh, which I'm very proud of. Then the new census data was applied, and it turns out that actually we were we were at the bottom the whole time, but but much less at the bottom. But uh, for, for a shining moment there, um, the the difference that we that this approach was making, I think, was palpable. And I'm very proud of that. Um, regarding your your question about mental health and all the other sorts of health, yeah, I think everyone can tell. I mean, I could tell after the first lockdown. Um, I was living in Kingston, and to walk down the street a lot of people visibly were not doing well. Um, it, it, it's actually, it's difficult to take a, a proper census of how many folks are under housed and, and, live, and sleeping rough, um, but it, it wasn't difficult to see that clearly the rate had gone up a lot and, and our um, pandemic policies had left the most vulnerable people visibly behind. I'll also say that as an ICU doctor, um, the people who I was seeing, um, were by and large essential workers. Um, so if you are a copywriter for an ad agency, you were in your condo downtown working on your MacBook, totally safe um, getting your Uber Eats. Um, if you were the Uber Eats driver, you weren't totally safe. If you're the Amazon warehouse worker, you weren't totally safe. Um, those folks were often um, lower income, uh, often from immigrant communities, um, and they bore the brunt of uh, COVID-19 in each of those waves because the, the lockdowns were not protecting them in the slightest. They were, if you were a bus driver, you still had to go to work. Um, so even the, the physical effects of um, the COVID-19 pandemic policies that we pursued didn't seem to stop the outcomes. It seemed to displace the outcomes onto, onto um, less fortunate folks. Um, but that said, so even if you were a more fortunate person uh, who got to uh, have Uber Eats delivered to you and still got a full paycheck or availed yourself of CERB. Um, I, social isolation is not good for anybody. And then as I, I do general medicine on the ward and the hospital as well, and I was seeing the outcomes of that. I was seeing more folks um, with overdose. I was seeing more folks with self-harm otherwise, um, more um, of the ravages of alcoholism. Um, one thing that really affected me uh, a lot uh, that I wrote about early on was um, I had in one week, I admitted two elderly women, one from a retirement home, one from a nursing home with starvation, <clears throat> because um, as you may recall, families were banned uh, from visiting their elders in care. Um, those homes were often understaffed. And it turned out that these women who had varying degrees of dementia would forget to eat um, and their families were the ones feeding them. So they, they came into hospital with biochemical evidence of starvation. Um, and this was occurring in Canada in 2020. And uh, I'm not going to get over that anytime soon. So I think, I hope that there's, you know, a Royal Commission or something like that. And we can talk about all of these other health outcomes um, and and who who didn't benefit, what were the benefits of lockdown and, and what were the harms. Um, we now know that opioid overdoses in, in young men in Ontario doubled over this period of time. It was already an epidemic. Um, and I, I hope that there's, there's just some acknowledgement that health is not a single disease. Um, health, is, uh, health is a social phenomenon. If you can't go to your dad's funeral, if you can't have your wedding, if your kids don't get to play on the playground, you, you're not healthy. Um, the World Health Organization has this, this well-known um, definition of health, that it's not merely the absence of disease. It's, it's, it's psychological and physical and spiritual, and it has to do with education, and it has to do with the health of your society and, and meaningful opportunities that like health is being able to do the things that you want to do in the time that you have. 
health is not living forever because none of us are going to do that. Um, so in some ways, I thought these were things we had already learned, um, but we're going to have to relearn them. Another really important analogy is the HIV uh, epidemic. Um, it turned out that stigma wasn't helpful. Um, there was a lot of stigma around who might get HIV and, and how, how ought we to protect ourselves from such people. And it turned out that was a positively backwards approach. And it was only once we started going to the areas where folks who were at high risk uh, for HIV and telling them that we cared about them and this is how they could protect themselves, um, that we really put a stop to the epidemic in North America. People often forget um, there was a travel ban on HIV positive individuals going to the United States until 2008. Um, it, like it's mystifying. And, it, and so some of the, some of the, I would say backwards things that were done about HIV took uh, 15, 20 years to undo. Um, I hope that we're faster this time in this sort of acknowledgement that, that health is, a, is more than the absence of disease. Right. I mean, there's, there's so much wisdom um, in, in what you just said and, and so many of the things that we thought we had learned and clearly we didn't because, uh, you know, the, to some of the points that you make, uh, we, you know, we know that more people under the age of uh, 65 in Canada died of diseases of despair um, than COVID. Um, I just read a report earlier this week about how alcohol related deaths uh, were higher for individuals under the 65 in the United States. Um, than all of COVID. So so all of these sort of second and third order impact have been killing people at, at a higher rate um, in some age groups than, than COVID itself. I just have one final question for you, Dr. Strauss. I was researching you a little bit uh, for this interview, and I noticed that there's a lot of controversy around you. Uh, there was a CBC piece uh, about how some people were trying to remove you from office, and some of your tweets have uh, gone under uh, scrutiny and fire talking to you I and mean, you're such a reasonable person and, and, and you know, so thoughtful. Uh, I, I wonder wh why, why is it that people are, are so uh, triggered uh, for lack of a better word by some of the things you, you put out there and you know, wh wh why is it, do you think that, that the CBC um, you know, treats you like, uh, you know, at least in the one piece I read, like, like you're some kind of a, a threat or a prior or something like that. Why, why do you think people react that way to you? I hope that we have a large conversation about this, to um, in, in the months and years to come. I think that in general, our society is not doing a great job at disagreeing with each other anymore. I see that at every level. I see that on Twitter a lot, um, but, but elsewhere. And I, I know that some of my colleagues in public health who maybe take opposite views of mine in terms of, you know, perhaps they thought we should have been more restrictionist and they get harassed a lot. And, and some of them had angry people showing up at their homes and, and felt that their security was threatened. Um, so I, I do think there is, in general, a decline in civility and our ability as adults to have reasonable discussions about things. So I think that, I think that you know, frankly, some of those CBC articles are, are part of that. Um, I, I have felt at times that um, <clears throat> legacy media institutions were deliberately taking what I had to say out of context. There's probably that, and that is part of a larger phenomenon about uh, you know, clickbait and uh, controversy um, selling and getting more clicks. Um, I, I know, I, I know that everything I tweeted about this pandemic, um, I stand by, it was all true. I, I, I made some attempts to put risk into perspective. <clears throat> you know, as we talked about in the initial reports where that this was going to kill three to 5% of people who got it. And it turned out that wasn't the case. It also turned out that the, the effects were highly age stratified. So people over 80 were on the order of five to 10,000 times more likely to die of COVID than somebody who's eight. Um, and I, I don't know why hearing that made some people so upset. Because to me, that's just the facts. Um, and the facts ought to inform our approach. I, a classmate of mine actually emailed me very early into my public commentary on the pandemic to say like, how can you write this? Um, people aren't gonna trust us if they're not scared. And I was like, no, I think that's the opposite. I think that if we scare people into compliance, that's not going to, they'll comply, but they won't trust us. Um, so I think some of it has been a strategic mishap, misstep from some folks um, who believe they have the public health at heart. But I, I think the, the essence of improving the public health is to build trust and to have trust you need honesty and accountability. And for that, you need to kind of baldly tell people some facts that maybe they, they didn't want to hear. So I think that's 
um, what engendered the quote unquote controversies that the, that the CBC has written about. Oh, well, I mean, that just that that comment, and I don't mean to pick on your friend who emailed you, but the idea that you have to scare people in order to get them to comply is, is just so uh, wrong in a, in a Western liberal democracy, in, in my opinion. And I, I think you're right. I think COVID made us all go a little crazy. Everyone's wound up so tight. I see it in social media. I saw it in the way that uh, people characterize the truckers. I saw it with some of the truckers themselves. Just you know, People are very angry <laughs> and, and they don't really have an outlet for that. Sometimes you see it. Uh, you know, I saw it uh, one day when I was shopping at Hudson's Bay. I saw a woman just absolutely losing her mind, yelling at a store clerk. Um, you know, that kind of thing was would have been really rare and uh, not really happening in a Canadian suburb, but it seems that it does happen uh, more and more. And I think that uh, we, we certainly have to have a more well, well-rounded approach, as you mentioned, when it comes to public health. Well, Dr. Shows, I really enjoyed our conversation. I hope we can have you uh, back on the program again soon. So thank you so much for joining us. I'd love to do that. Thanks for having me. All right. That's Dr. Matt Strauss. I'm Kenneth Malcolm, and this is The Kenneth Malcolm Show.